All righty. Um, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed, of, compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and the set down of the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be weary and faint in your minds. Oh, let's see. Verse 4. Verse 4 says, You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. The word of God for the people of God. Father in heaven, we thank you today, Lord God. We thank you for loving us, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity that you've given us once again to come before you to sing praise to your great and holy name to give to you out of what you have entrusted us with and now to hear your life transforming word we ask you god to prepare our hearts even now to receive your word we're praying that you would enlighten the eyes of our understanding give us strength courage and wisdom to apply your word to our daily lives lord that your name might be glorified by our living and that we might accomplish all your will we ask these things in jesus name we pray amen amen you may be seated in the presence of the lord god almighty so yeah um i want to talk to you about uh being a, a successful christian success as a christian one of the, I was in the, every now and then, um, it probably happens pretty often. I don't know about Mark, Minister Mark, but sometimes the, coming up with a title is like a challenge all in itself, right? Well, Mark, I was listening to someone the other day, and they were doing some, talking about some church history and things like that. And the um, guy said that the gentleman came over and he was from, I don't know what country he was from, I forget exactly, but he said he was surprised, this was a, uh, you know, years ago, when he discovered that Americans had titles for their messages, because they just preached the Bible, you know. And uh, he said he found it to be a challenge, like, you know, you got to come up with, with a title, but that's what we, you know, I was born into this, <laughs> this needing a title uh, world. So. Um, it kind of liberated me a tad bit, so I said, you know, I don't have to think too hard about it. Just, uh, you know, stick something up there and just make sure it ain't irreverent or anything like that, you know, that it's not dishonorable to uh, God. And other than that, you know, you can be close. And you may be see some titles as close to what something else was, you know. Success as a Christian. Christian success. Successful Christianity. Right? I want to talk about uh, being a successful Christian today. Um, you know, the Bible describes the Christian life in many different ways, um, uh, many different uh, types of uh, things, particularly uh, sometimes it's a fight. You know, Jude, Jude talks about contending for the faith. You know, Paul described it to Timothy, uh, sometimes like a farmer who's planting and he's waiting for his, his harvest. Um, he describes it, you know, here is described as a race. It's, it's a contest. Uh, that oftentimes, you know, the Apostle Paul would use uh, uh, these, this allegory, these types of um, contest, you know, striving of a man is striving for mastery, striving to win a prize and things uh, as the Christian, uh, to describe the Christian race. So, and here we uh, uh, describe the Christian life. And here is described as, you know, running this race that is set before us. Uh, and I think there's a reason for that, because there's some particular things that go on whenever you're involved in a, in a contest and trying to win a, win a fight, win a race, uh, uh, win a, uh, you know, some type of event that, uh, number one, and I'm just going to get right into it, um, that I think that a successful Christian, uh, Paul would, uh, would tell us, and the writer of Hebrews would want us to know that a successful Christian plans for success. 
Uh, he doesn't just expect it to just to stumble upon success. You know, when you have uh, you know teams, uh, you know athletes and things, they, you know they normally have planned for success. They may not always get it, but they are planning for it and trying to get it. As a matter of fact, if they're not striving and trying really hard, you know, the coach is unsatisfied. You know, people are unsatisfied with that. You have to plan for success. You have to act as though you really want to win, that you want to be who God wants you to be, that you want to conquer things and, and accomplish, you know, the, the work of God for your life. I think that um, a part of planning for success, what we read, he says that you got to lay aside the sin and the weight that does so easily set us back. It easily sets us back. And so that tells us that there are things that in our lives that God is telling us that we're going to have to put aside, that we're going to have to strip off, things that we're going to have to, you know, that was once a part of us and we got to do away with it. And you got to begin to evaluate yourself and think about things that, you know, where I am now in my life and what, some, what are some things that I've laid aside. You know, I, I, had to, I had to put that behind me. I had to let it go. And sometimes there are things that are te uh, dear or tender to our hearts, but they're not good for us. OK, sometimes there are things that are not necessarily bad in themselves, but they are bad for who God wants you to be. All right. So Melissa and I went to. A basketball game uh, several years ago. The Lakers were coming to uh, play the Pelicans, and so we wanted to go see Kobe Bryant. And so we had our tickets and everything to go to the game. And you know, a couple days before the game, the, the report comes out that Kobe Bryant got a little injury. You know, so he might not. You know, not you know, he might not play. So I mean, we're going to be pretty disappointed if he didn't play because you know we wanted to go see Kobe. And so we were at the game, we're sitting at the game, and you know, they got the shoot around, the guys are out there, the players are out there shooting around, and Kobe's out there shooting around in his warm-up where everybody had their warm-ups on. And we had no confidence because he was shooting around because he had on his warm-ups. And we know that if you're wearing warm-ups, that is not a sign that you're ready to compete. It wasn't until the horn sounded, the warm-up period was over, it's time for the game to start, and he grabbed those pants and he stripped off those warm-ups, and then we knew he's playing tonight, right? He's playing tonight. But you see, he had, we, it wasn't until, he, we knew that he was serious, we knew that he was ready, we knew that he was going to play because he stripped off the things that would hinder him and performing his best. And, and that's why I think the Bible describes the Christian life so many times as this athletic contest because there, there's so many things that athletes would go through and, and do in, in order to try to excel and be the best that they can be. Yeah. Right? And so Paul says here is that, he's like, look, I mean, we're not, well, I we said the right of Hebrews because it didn't, uh, didn't say Paul. But the right of Hebrews says that you have to lay aside, you know, every weight. The sin, he says, because you cannot be who you want, or God wants you to be and have it in your life because it easily sets you, sets you back. And those guys, you know, have nice warm-ups. Man, those warm-ups are really nice and they look very nice, but they take them off and throw them to the side because those things will hinder them in moving freely and, uh, and being the best that they can be out there. You know, sometimes, you know, I mean, you, you'll see a boxer come into a ring, right? And some, you know, and normally they have a cape on or something, sometimes just a towel. They got uh, your boy, uh, what's his name, Deontay Wilder? He, he wear, got a whole, he about, look like about 20 pounds of gear he come in the ring with, you know? But that's just coming into the ring. But when it's time to compete, when the bell rings, they strip all that stuff off. And I don't know why sometimes as Christians we think that because we can ask God to forgive us, but God will just forgive you. You can ask God to forgive you, then we can keep holding on to things that we know we should lay aside. Yeah, maybe God will forgive me, but that thing is still going to hinder me. It's still going to set me back. It's still going to stop me from really flourishing and being all that I can be, which is what I owe God. I owe him to be the best me that I can be. That is why he purchased me. Are you with me? And then what Paul said to the Philippians, he said, look, I am trying to become all that Christ grabbed hold of me to become. I owe it to God to lay this stuff aside, to give it my best. Right. I owe it to him to give it my best shot. There has to be purpose. It should be purpose in everything you do. 
There should be purpose in everything, everything that you do. When you come to church, there should be purpose in that. You know, I mean, it should be, it should be, a, it should be a good purpose in that. I'm, I'm coming to church with purpose. I'm not just going through motion. I want to gain knowledge. I want to grow in God. I want to improve my character. There should be some, should be purpose in that. You know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 26, Paul talked about how he had purpose in what he did. And he says, so I do not run aimlessly. All right. So I'm not out there, there's a track meet going on. I ain't just running around in the grass. You know, he said, I, I, there's a goal here. He said, I, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm a boxer. I'm not just beating the air, you know. I'm trying to hit the target. There's purpose. There has to be purpose in what you do. And, and for the Christian, we have to plan for it. We have to make preparations. And then the goal is that, you know, because I'm trying to perfect this. And, and I know that, that, that when I say the word perfect, the, you know, we think about perfect. You say, oh, man, nobody's perfect. I said, we're trying to perfect it, which means that we're always pushing, that we're always striving, that we never get to a point where we say, well, I'm good. The only thing that can make you get to a point, well, not the only thing, but one of the things that can make you get to a point where you feel like I'm good is you begin to care, compare yourself with somebody else. And you can look at somebody else who's a little behind you and say, well, I'm good. Because, I mean, compare yourself to the standard of God, which is to become Christ-like. And when I compare myself to becoming Christ-like, I know that I got a ways to go. Oh, I'm sorry, I got a mighty long ways to go. So I have to press and I have to push. And so we have to learn how to, how to you know, and, and, and keep striving so that our lives are, 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 are harmonious with, in, in harmony with the biblical description of what a Christian is. And so you got to learn. There's a constant, there's a constant learning uh, in the, uh, going on. Learning how to live this Christian life in a non-Christian environment. Right? You got to learn how to be a Christian at your job. Right. You got to learn how to respond to people who don't who don't who, who, who maybe are not approaching you properly. You got to learn how to respond to your feelings in a Christian manner. You got to learn how to respond to temptation. You got to learn how to put Christ's will over self will. This is a constant you know, learning thing. You got to learn how to care about the feelings of others. It doesn't always come natural for people. You know, the natural tendency, I think, of most people is to care about self. And we have to learn as a Christian, if we're going to imitate Christ, that Christ cared about people. And we have to learn how to care about others. If, I if that's the last I checked, the Bible says you need to prefer another over yourself. That's a great challenge. But those are the areas that we have to strive in. We have to learn how to be faithful and learn how to, how to give and to forgive. Right? Learn how to pray and to study God's word, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? It takes effort. It takes effort. So you got to see the goal. And I've said this so many times in our, in our being together. You have to see your goal as being greater than the struggle, greater than the effort it takes. Right? It's, it takes a mighty great effort to do those things we're talking about and to trying to perfect this Christian life and pushing and loving and forgiving and, and fighting temptations and, and thinking about others and putting God before yourself. It takes effort to do that. But the goal of pleasing God and accomplishing his will for your life is far greater than any effort that you could ever push forth, that you could, that you could ever be required to put forth. Mark chapter 10, verses 29 to 30, I got... Um, got uh, most of it here. Jesus said, there is no one, you know, uh, Peter said, Lord, we left everything to follow you. You know, and Jesus said, look, no one has left house or brothers or sisters or father, a mother, a wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who should not receive 100 fold now in this life and in, the, and in the age to come eternal life. Lord. Oh, the goal is far greater than the struggle. The goal is far greater than the struggle. There's something required of me and there's something required of you. And what I've discovered is that each person's calling determines the self-discipline and the self-denial that's required. 
Some, that's something required of all of us. God requires something of us. He requires self-discipline and self-denial. And depending on what the calling is, you know, it depends on how much is required. And the standard according to Jesus in, in Luke 12, 48, for everyone to whom much is given, much is required. To whom much is given, as much is required. Now let's kind of put this in a, in, a, in a certain perspective, right? And let's think about this because here we have, here in here in America we have people. You can you can you, you can read a Bible. Bibles are free. You can find them a dime a dozen if you want to, right? Uh, like I said, really free. People will give you a Bible. They can Bible on your phone. It's free. Whatever. Right. And we neglect to read it and to discover God's word. And then you got people in some countries that are closed off and hostile to the faith. And they are sneaking and risking their very lives to learn God's word. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? What I'm saying to you is that what they are doing sometimes far exceeds what we do. But actually we are required. More is required of us because more has been given to us. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Right. There's no way in the world a person who's got to sneak and risk their lives to learn God's word should know more about God's word than a man who could do, have it free Luke and go sit in the middle of the park and put a sign up saying, I'm reading the Bible and nobody can do you nothing. No way that that person who's got to sneak should know more about God's word than me. Are you with me? Right? To whom much is given, much is required. And so what I have to do, what you have to do is to see all we putting forth as much effort as we should based on what we've been given. Are you with me? Now, I'm going to tell you one other thing. I'm not going to talk to you long, even though this other thing could take 20 minutes. <laughs> Mark and I were talking earlier. We were talking about the boxing match last night, and Mark began I almost started to preach my sermon. So I tried to end the conversation because I don't want you to preach my sermon now. now he was, so Mark said, look, man, I'm telling you, he said, you know, every time I watch, you know, boxing, anything like that, you know, sporting events, I always think about the spiritual life. I always think about the spiritual life, man. He said that Crawford last night, Crawford was fighting uh, Spence. He said, I'm going to tell you something, man, Crawford was focused. Right? My first point was that the successful Christian plans for success. My second point is that he maintains a proper focus. Are you with me? You told me that I knew I was on the right. I knew I was on the right path because I, I, I wrestled with God a little bit about the message. I was like, God, I just preached this uh, from these scriptures uh, in May of uh, last year. You know, so can we check find something else? I tried to find some other scripture. This I never. It just wasn't. And so uh, when Mark talked to me, well, what, first of all, what God told me is that look, wait up. I'm going to work. I got this. You know, I'll, I'll work this out. You got you, you got you got a process you go through to determine what the word is for, you know, for a particular day. You went through the process. This is where you've landed. So I got it. And, you know, sometimes we still kind of like, you know, you know I, I, yeah. But and then Mark came right over there, I was sitting in the sound booth and said he was focused. And that's what we got to be focused. Amen, brother. <laughs> A successful Christian maintains a proper focus. He maintains a proper focus. Mark said when, when uh, he said Crawford was in that fight, in that boxing match, he said, "Man, and he was focused. He was. He said they had one task at hand, and he was focused, laser focused on that task." What happens when a Christian is laser focused on pleasing the Lord, doing the will of God? There are distractions all over the place. He, Crawford was in that ring. There are people yelling, screaming, this and that. And he got focused on one thing, that boy's head. <laughs> Focus on the wrong things can discourage you. It can deceive you, right? It can make it difficult for you to continue pushing because the, you know, the wrong focus will wear you down. It is a weight. It will wear you down. <laughs> Psalm 73, verses 1 through 3. Uh, this is Asaph uh, saying, Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are of a, in a pure, uh, pure in heart. But as for me, my feet almost stumble. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So, so 
I thought about this and I said, first of all, you know, just keep this in mind, guys. And you know as well as I do that everybody that's smiling ain't happy. Right? Yeah, everybody's smiling and happy. But that wasn't the problem for Asaph. It wasn't the fact that, that he saw wicked people appearing to be happy. He's got some struggle going on in his life. Look like they ain't got no problem. Everything's going great. The problem for him was that he was focusing on the wrong thing. He, his focus was supposed to be on God who called him. God who appointed him. God who gave him promises to live by. That is what he was supposed to focus on. But he got his focus off of that and it began to affect him. It began, it, it, thank God he, he, for his faithfulness, he didn't let him slip. But you saw, he, I mean, what he said. He said, man, my feet almost slipped. So think about it. If he is struggling to maintain his balance, he's surely not pressing forward. And the goal for us is to press forward. And if we're always struggling just to keep our feet under us, we're not going to be able to press forward. And I was thinking about this. I was imagining, because you know, the Bible describes Satan as having fiery darts and I'm thinking like, boy, here it is, you know, uh, I'm on the Christian light, on the Christian journey, I'm on that path, and he's shooting at me. If I'm standing in one spot, just trying to keep my balance, I'm a much easier target to hit than somebody who's constantly on the move. Are you with me? You gotta move, and you gotta be on the move. Asaph's problem was that he was focusing on, he, he lost, his focus was on the people and what they were doing instead of the promises of God. When Melissa and I pray at night and we take turns, one of the things that, you know, I, I, I like to uh, thank God for is the assurances and the promises of his word. You know, because you got you to keep that in mind. That God gives us great assurances in his word. And I will never leave you nor forsake you. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Right. I will be with you always. Oh, yeah, I, I, he gives us assurances and promises. You know, if you, you know, you call out to me, I will hear and I will answer. Great and precious promises is what Peter called them. Yeah, there was another per, uh, person that, uh, that did that kind of got their focus off when we saw that it affected him. You remember Peter walking on the water? He's walking on the water. I mean, he's walking on water, right? He is doing it. But it doesn't matter how, how, what, how great the task or whatever God is using you for. You got to maintain that, that focus. You got to focus on him and not the distractions that are going around you. And if things are, if, if the if temptations are coming, you got to look more intently at God and at his word. And Peter's walking on water, and the Bible says the wind got boisterous, boisterous the, the waves, everything's cutting up, and all of this lightning's flashing, and Peter starts to look at that, and he begins to sing. And thank God he didn't let him drown. You know, he, he saved him, but he, that was the end of his walking on the water, right? That was the end of it. He was walking on the water to go to Jesus. Jesus had to go and pull him out of the water. He couldn't finish his walk because he lost his, his focus. Yes. Are you with me? Amen. You got to maintain that focus. You got to focus on God. That's why you got to force yourself into God's word if necessary. Right? You got to force God, force yourself to, to get God's word in your mind and in your heart on a daily basis because you got to keep that focus because the world is not designed to make you focus on God. Our focus should be the things that help us focus on the Lord. I think uh, Paul, uh, the writer of Hebrews said in verse 1 of chapter 12, um, was it verse 1? Uh, he says that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. All right? I think we should be looking at those who have gone before us, who have lived good and solid Christian lives. Lived solid Christian lives and sometimes in more difficult circumstances than you and I have to live in. And that they've gone on to wait their, await their reward. We should keep them in mind and say the God that brought them through is the same God we serve. 
right? We should focus and, and, and look carefully, uh, you know, look at current Christians who are living solid Christian lives. Those who are living solid Christian lives and producing fruit. The Bible tells us as much. Philippians 3.17, Paul says, Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. See, God doesn't design this, this thing for you to just figure it out on your own and walk it alone. He gives us examples and patterns to follow. Hebrews 13, 7 says, Remember those who rule over you and have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow. Consider the outcome of their conduct. So you see people walking that path. You see the joy. You see the peace. You see the fruit and the faithfulness. Follow that example. Right? We don't have to reinvent the wheel here. Follow that example. Focus on what's right and, and proper. And of course we should look to Jesus who is the ultimate example of, of everything. As a matter of fact, in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, in this Bible, the, the, the Bible uh, translated, or whoever wrote the, whoever printed the Bible decided to put Christ our example as the uh, topic. You know, sometimes they have a topic in front of a chapter. Christ our example. So, but I got to say this, right, well, I'm, because I'm so close, um, because I said Jesus is that as the greatest example of all. But I want to make sure I be clear, I'm clear in case anybody ever gets sidetracked. Because uh, there's, a, there's a movement that has been around a long time that says Jesus, that's all Jesus is. He is an example. He is our example on how to live. He is an example. But being an example is not primary for Christ. Maybe secondary. But he, he's primarily a savior. Are you with me? And there's a branch of uh, Christian liberal, liberalism, liberalism that says he's just an example. You follow his example, right? We should follow his example. But before I can follow his example, I need to submit and surrender to him as Savior. Are you with me? Right? He came to save me, to pay the penalty for my sins and deliver me from wrath. That's what he did. He is a Savior. And then he is an example of how to live a saved life. Are y'all with me? Now, we, uh, verse 3 said that um, for the joy that was set before him, Jesus, he endured the cross. For the joy that was set before him, that the Father cast this vision out in front of Jesus and he came to earth. After you accomplish your mission, this is, the, this is the end result. And he never lost sight of that. He maintained his focus, right? You got you to you know who God wants you to be, know what he's calling you to, to do, know the type of person he wants you to be, and never lose sight of that. Don't let situations cause you to, you know, to lose sight of that. Don't let successes cause, you know, sometimes we, we focus and talk about, you know, trials, tribulations, difficulties. But one of the most, the, the, uh, most trying times for Christians is, is just continued success. Uninterrupted success, and uh, uh, you know, it gets Paul said. Remember, Paul says, "Like, man, I got all of these revelations and stuff." He said, to "Keep me from being exalted above measure." God sends me some trouble because because isn't that, isn't that amazing that sin is so corrupted us that we can't even enjoy uninterrupted success because that don't make us act stupid, right? Lord, I tell you, I'm looking forward to being delivered from this body of death, as Paul says, right? So, the vision that God has for you is to be Christ-like. That's where your success is. That's where your joy is. That's where your victory and your satisfaction will be. At times, it will be easy to focus on Christ, but other times it takes intentional effort. You have to do whatever it takes. You have to do what it takes. You have to maintain focus. You wake up in the morning, and you're just like that boxer that Mark said. He came into the ring. Said, Sometimes there are times for other things, but right now, it's time to be focused on the task at hand. As Christians, there will be a time for how to do this, you know, hallelujah, good time. And, but right now, in this life, we must always be focusing on accomplishing God's will, fighting against the things that try to hinder us and slow us down and stop us from accomplishing that because we don't have a whole lot of time. 
I was, just, I was at a funeral just yesterday, reminding, it was reminding me again that you don't have a lot of time, right? This is, this is not the vacation, this is the job. The book of Revelation says that the vacation's coming. Says that, he says that blessed are they who die in the Lord, they will rest from their labors, right? And their works will follow them. This is the work. The work is now. We gotta stay focused. We gotta stay focused. I'll read one scripture and I'm gonna end it. Uh, Philippians 4, 8. It says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just and whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate and think on these things. Think on these things. It takes intentional effort. Because once upon a time, you know, you, you know, you'd have to turn a, turn a TV on, or you have to go to a store and get a magazine, a book, and now you got that phone in your pocket. You know, it could be the ultimate blessing or the ultimate distraction. Right? You choose. You control it. You control what you focus on. You control, you know, whether your focus would be victory or not. You do. In every race, I know that. In every contest, in every, every game, right? I have never played a game where, um, you know, the goal wasn't to win. I don't care if it's Monopoly or Parcheesi, whatever it is, the goal was always to win. In this Christian life, the goal should be to win. To accomplish God's will for my life. To be where he wants me to be, when he wants me there, doing what he wants me to do. Right? But winning requires steady progression. The Christian life, and I've said this in the past, the Christian life is not a sprint. Right? It's more like a marathon. If you remember me saying that, in a sprint, there's really no time to get discouraged. There's really no time to, you know, to want to give up. In a, in a, you know, in a hundred meter uh, sprint, there's really not time to think about, man, you know, uh, I don't know if I'm gonna make it. You know, you just, zoof, you know, you're talking about seconds. But in a marathon, there can be time, you know, you, I don't know, I'm gonna tap out. Christian life is like a marathon. There's time enough to get discouraged, to get weak, and so you gotta stay focused. You gotta use the resources God gives you. You gotta use your church, you gotta use your brothers and sisters, you gotta use the word, you gotta use praise, right? Garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You gotta use all of the resources that God gives you, right? You gotta use the examples he gives you of people who are, who, who, who are, who are, who are perfected what you struggle with. Because you know, everybody struggles here and there, but sometimes the things that you struggle with, somebody else has already overcome it. You gotta use those examples, right? But one of the other things I love about the marathon aspect of the Christian race is that because it's a marathon, you see in a, in a sprint, if you take out, if, if a guy's running 100 meter and he, and he stumbles at the, at, at the starting gate, he probably gonna lose, right? Because there's not a lot of time to recover. Yeah. But in a marathon, you could even fall down and get up because there's time to recover. Are you hearing me? Yes. God gives you time to recover. And so what we got to do is that we got to make those adjustments at the very moment we see that they are needed. Prepare to win, right? Focus on things that are helpful. Focus on God. Focus on his word. Focus on those good things. Make adjustments the moment you see they are needed. And then steadily progress so that you can walk into a successful Christian living. Amen? Amen. Amen. We stop right here.